one, it's not enough just to say, look, there's my work, go look at it. You know, because there is a connection but between I, creation and... I can understand artists who are reluctant to do that because you don't want to pitch your own work. You don't want to be, you don't want to be selling the book. You know, you want the work to sell itself. You want the people's experience to be one of their own. You don't want to lead people in that experience. So I can understand artists who are reluctant to do that. On the other hand, I think any way that allows one to engage a work of art is probably useful. If you can direct people into the work, it's probably useful. Since we're on this subject, you know, what's, tell me what is the purpose of art? It's purposefully uh, without purpose. <laughs> there isn't any purpose to no, art. I'm staying away from functionality. We, we know how you feel about that. Okay, then in, I think, okay, I think purpose is to generate thought. And thought is a catalyst to um, think things you hadn't thought before. And if people can generate new thoughts or empowered to think things they hadn't thought before, then it fulfills in them something they lack. And if they can um, relate to other people about what they've been empowered with that they lack, and, and they understand by merely saying Matisse means one thing, and saying Cezanne it means something else, and saying Pollock it means something else, and saying Diego Rivera it means something else, into saying de Kooning it means something else, and saying Velasquez it means something else, immediately you have a vocabulary of different facets of experience and of emotion that is something we all lack, and when you say those names, it brings to bear what those feelings might be. And different works of art provide different experiences. If you ask me, what's the purpose of art? Yes. To provide different experiences, to, to provide a host of experiences that cannot be found in any other venue. It's different in time, it's different in, in how we relate to the world. And it teaches us to see the world in a way we haven't and seen And a stimulus before. to understanding yourself? I would think so, I would hope so, because if it fulfills something we lack in ourselves, and it fulfills something that we hadn't thought before, that it adds a great breath to our, I mean, the fact that Nero did what he did, I feel enriched for it. I'm not a great Nero fan, but certainly I feel better for it. Uh, you know, I mean, I think art fulfills in us something that we need. We need that expression that we ourselves can't um, understand in ourselves, and artists open the door to that feeling. I think great poetry does it, I think great music does it, I think great painting does it, I think great sculpture does it. I think it's what makes society rich. Most of what's flashed at us every day in terms of the media is immediately dismissed. But there are works of art that you can go back to that you have an experience with once and you go back to it and they're in your mind's eye and it's not commensurate with the experience you go back to again. So you can return again and again to say Matisse's Red Room or, or Monet's Water Lilies Upstairs or you can go through this museum and have experiences that you can only have in that kind in relationship to those expressions. And art offers a multitude of different kinds of experiences. And if you ask me if that's purposely useful, sure, it enriches our lives in ways that other things do not. I mean, you can Significantly in ways that other things do not. And it's, it's, worth to give your, it's worth to dedicate your life for. I mean, your life's a nanosecond. And if you want to make a contribution at all, and you have any ability to do it, why not? Why wouldn't one do that? Has it been everything you wanted it to be? So far. Yeah, it's been a great ride. And gets better and better. I don't know about that. Why well, wouldn't you say that? Because it's not I mean, you can't point to a better period in your life it's, as it's a not, creator. It's, it's not qualitatively that it's better. Uh, uh, what, what is it? Better because you what? That you see the fulfillment of your ideas extended into the world and you see that that communication is possible in relation to other people having experiences that you would like someone to have. That's, what's, that's what, if there's any kind of feedback at all, to see people find um, an experience that they find hopeful or joyful or lyrical or that that's a great reward. Does and that, that's really unforeseen. You, you, you can't predict that. And that hasn't been true of my work until I would say the last 10 years. Do I think it could have been true before earlier? Sure, but it could be that the audience was behind the curve, or it could be that there wasn't an audience for the work, or it could be that 
the language of the work itself has built its own audience. Well, it could be that everything has its own time. Fine. Yeah. Fine. That's all right. But in order for everything to have its own time, the people have to continue to work. And I think that exactly. one of the things that artists really need to be able to do is because the way fashion is and the way the art world tur turns over decade after decade is to be able to sustain work. And for artists in their 40s and 50s, oftentimes when they're out of favor, that's when they really have to work the hardest because they have to be there as the critical backbencher. They have to be there as the alternative. Time magazine has a big story about you. At the dawn of the 21st century and in the era of cyberspace reproduction and the internet, no one is doing more to make work that stands for the ancient and mysterious power of the real. I think that's because people who walk into the work are having an unmediated experience. They're having a real experience about their own subjectivity. They're having the experience in kind that they can only find in something that has not been mediated before. And it happens to be sculpture in this instance. They also said this, so to enter and circulate within the distorted bowl of his torque ellipse, you find yourself inside a resolutely abstract geometric volume that is also somehow a womb, a crater, an inlet, and a chamber. By its powerful address to both the body and the subconscious, it sets in motion some very deep mental reflexes, including theories having to do with anguish, awe, and desire. Fine. I if mean, that's what he sees, that's okay with you. That's great. That's and, it's, and, it, and you think he's pushing to where you want it to be. No, I, I can't predict how people are going to experience the work. But if the work is full and it's generative enough, people will be able to relate to it and have references to it in a variety of ways. Five-year-old kids will run through it and it'll be a big exactly. playpen. Other people will come to it and it, it'll be, have a symbolic, iconic reference. It depends on the history of your relation, probably the date you were born, wh where the nation, the country you were, where you were raised, exactly. the art that you've been exposed to. But I think if that writer found those words and it's true for him, bravo. When you look at all this work that's here, uh, and, and from the beginning to the end, one has to build on the other. Have there been missteps? I mean, have you made, uh, gone off on tangents that you found, you thought would be productive that didn't become productive? I've built pieces in steel mills, very large, that I've had to say thumbs down to. Why? In other words, I'm trying, I know that artists who, can, who paint will simply destroy the canvas yeah, well, I, you know, sometimes the next day. But we're not talking about no, something we're, we're, they painted last night. No, we're, we're, talking, talking about something we're talking about a lot of money going down the drain. Exactly right. Yeah, I've done that. I've done it because also the steel workers saw maybe 13, 14, 15 pieces go by in a year. They saw the 16th one come up, and I could see the look on their face, and I could see it myself, and I knew it wasn't there, and so we jumped What in. wasn't there? Whatever response I needed to have that they needed to have that we knew was true in the mill, it just wasn't happening, and we knew it. Look, if, if a piece is going to resound well in this enormous cavern of a steel mill where you're building a form, and you've, you've stood up, you know, a dozen pieces, and all of a sudden you stand one up, and everybody knows it's a dog, and you know it's a dog, that it's just flat, you say, sorry, folks, that's yeah. it. That's happened, yeah. It doesn't happen often, but it's happened. And, and do you know why it happens? No. You don't? No. It's not like you can say, oh, well, I, yeah, I, I, click, I know what I did that went wrong. Well, there. no, I know, I know after, I know that, but I can't foresee until I actually set a piece in a steel mill whether it's going to give me the feedback I need, because you can't place yourself in the experience of a work until you build it. And no matter what you do in terms of um, an artifice, whether you build a model or you enter it through a, a video or whatever, that doesn't give you the real-time experience of the work in place, doesn't. You know, postcards don't work. Tell me about this steel. It, it's core 10. It's probably two and a third inches thick. This piece is probably upward of 30, 40 ton each plate, so it's probably a 50 ton piece maybe. And it will change over time. Yeah, in about eight years, it'll reach a dark, dark amber, and then that color will hold, and it will cease to oxidize, and that'll be the cover color it is forever. But 
Cortense steel, that's the nature of the material itself. It takes about eight or ten years to reach its final oxidization. Then it becomes dark, dark amber, like the Seagram's building. And then it yeah. retains that color and that's it. When it goes through the colorization, a lot of people say, oh, rusty waste, and a lot of people will then get involved with the colorization and say, oh, I like it for its painting quality. I know that it's going to be one flat, dark color after eight or ten years, so I don't get that involved with being attached to however it is at a given moment. This is all done in Germany. Yes. Why Germany? They take a great deal of pride in what they make, and they make the best, it's a, they have a history of making the best steel manufactured work ever. And in this country, that was true during the war when the shipyards and the steel mills were interfaced, but that's no longer true. I started building in this country for, for a while, but the shipyards right now are pretty much defunct and the steel mills are on their last knees. So to really get a product well made, you have to go to Germany. And I've taught the people in Ziegen, a town, really how to build these pieces and they've bought machines and they've gone to uh, the CATIA program in terms of computerization so they know how to do things that they couldn't possibly have done before I started working with them and we've learned together. And what do you show them, a model? I so show them a model, then they send me back uh, something on the, on the net and then we go back and forth in terms of uh, programs and then I build another model and then they send me a steel model and it goes back and forth till eventually I say now we've got it, then I go there and we, we yeah. order the steel, we cut the template and then we bend the steel right there and stand them up. And that process can take anywhere between a year and three years. Are you pushing the boundaries of engineering? Oh yeah, and pushing the boundaries of tendency to overturn and uh, pushing the boundaries of uh, what's possible in relation to the manufacture of steel. But you're not an engineer by training? No. And I'm not a mathematician, no. So you go to those guys and those men and women and they tell you What's you make possible? models. I've, I've actually made models where engineers have told me that won't stand up, and I'm, show, I'm showing the model right in front of us, and it's standing up. So I'm saying, <laughs> <laughs> you know, how so, can you tell me that? So why not? would they be that disconnect? Because we're bending pieces that are curved in a way that you can't find in some math programs. I mean, a torque ellipse hadn't been made before. Something that um, it rotates in its elevation that doesn't change in its radius hadn't been made before. So there's no program that they can go to to verify if something's leaning both forward and outward within a given plane. There are certain things that they can understand in terms of tendency to overturn at a certain point. But as it goes higher and leans more, they don't know. So we have to build models. And then we build models and they test them and they say yes or no. Here's what I want to understand too. So there is the steel mill, is your brain, your heart, a steel mill, uh, there is also rigging. Yes. Where do you put that in this process? As an extension of uh, my hand in relation to um, pulling these pieces together in the most safe, logical way possible. And that takes a great deal of patience and a great deal of effort. And, uh, and a great deal of planning ahead.